So welcome. Um, today we're going to talk about locking down Kubernetes on Azure. My name is Oliver, Oliver Lohmann. I'm with Microsoft and I'm working there as a cloud solution architect. And today I'm here with... Yeah, my name, my name is Darko Krizic. I'm CTO of Prodyna. And yeah. Darko and I were working together um, on a project at a customer, and Dark was giving us an overview on the different topics um, that we were confronted with there. Okay, so <clears throat> we have a customer. It's a worldwide large enterprise, um, and uh, we are not allowed to mention the customer and not about details what we did, but um, the customer, we, we, we have a huge amount of data, and we need to process the data and make this data available for employees of the company. And uh, this customer said, um, we need to be agile. We need uh, to bring this application quickly into production. So don't you start doing anything on premise. Please use cloud technologies and especially uh, use Microsoft Azure because we have already a, a contract with Azure. And um, they said, <clears throat> everybody who is using the application, including the administrators, must pass our two-factor authentication, being notebooks with smart cards. This is our company policy. This is, must be true for every environment, for all people working. And they said, um, we have confidential data which we store in the cloud, and this means that everybody who is going to access it, two-factor I mentioned, plus I am the master of this environment. I would like to have full control who has access to it, including all companies supporting the project. Plus, if there's any suspicious activity for people accessing wrong data, I would like to have a red button which deactivates any communication to the system. So this is the starting point. As I mentioned, it's a big application, huge amount of data. So we started developing this application. And uh, did I mention everything? Yeah. So uh, one, one, one noteworthy detail um, is this application is not connected to a VPN to the existing intranet of the customer. We created a public-facing application simply due to performance and easiness of development. So it's a <clears throat> dedicated resource group running in Azure, and all the employees of the company worldwide are accessing it directly over the internet. So this is also a challenging thing. And yeah, let's talk about how we did it. Yes. Think about the application basically as a SaaS system that the customer wanted to build for his or her employees, so like an extension to O365 and its behavior, basically. Um, and if we look at the task that we face there, the most important side quest for us, so the biggest non-functional requirement in the room, was to protect that valuable data that the customer wanted to process in that system. So it's a huge number crunching system, thousands of cores in the end that we needed to burn there, so a huge amount of data. and. In the end, it's the crown jewels of that customer, research information, so really tangible stuff. And you can picture, especially after the panel discussion yesterday evening, I'm not sure if um, people listened to that, where we talked about public cloud versus on-premise, that there are certain like bad feelings in the tummy area for large enterprises, especially in Germany, um, to put such an information on public cloud. But we talked, and um, we talked through strategies. What do you do if you work with highly secure information? You use the best practices. There was just a talk in the small tent before that, talking about how to develop secure systems. And use things like defense and depth. You have a multi-layered security approach. You make sure that you do threat modeling to analyze how you build the system. And in the end, we um, strive for that metaphor here to build a castle that has multiple layers to protect the crown jewelry. So you put the jewels in a box, you lock the box. You put the box in a room, you put guards in front of the box. Then you have the big walls, then you have the moat, then you have the drawbridge, you have the portcullis coming down. Stuff like that is basically, metaphorically speaking, layers of um, security that we combined. And what we're going to do now is um, basically decomposing that solution with you to give you an idea um, about the bits and pieces that we touched. 
And um, this image here will be like um, our curtains that we lift each by each. So we first gonna touch on how the actual security um, regime on the Kubernetes cluster side look like, so what principles we use there. Then we go um, to the Azure networking piece as a layer protecting the Kubernetes cluster. Then how to integrate that with platform as a service components, so especially if you wanna get rid of state in your Kubernetes cluster, which is from the operations perspective, especially in enterprise environments where skills are limited sometimes, a good idea. Um, and then look at the governance piece, how we can control everything at large also. And uh, then we touch on identity and access to that system and how we actually automate all the things. So Darko will guide us through the actual implementation of the Kubernetes cluster and the stuff we um, did there. So um, we developed this application. We have about 10 custom developed uh, microservices, mostly based on Spring Boot. We are running an Elasticsearch, we are running MongoDB, we are running a Neo4j cluster. And um, just to give you an impression, this whole environment has about 10 nodes in normal working time. But when we do mass data processing, we scale up to 150 nodes, which, which is about 2,300 cores and uh, about 16 terabytes of RAM. So we have a lot of data to process, and we process this over one weekend. And this is one of the features we can do in the cloud. Um, we, what One challenge we had when we created this, uh, by the way, is um, there's a product called a AKS today, MS, uh, Azure um, Kubernetes Service. Um, the, there was an older product called ACS, Azure Container Services, but now it's replaced by AKS. Um, AKS was in the early stage, um, and there is an underlying technology that we use directly. It's called AKS Engine. It's called AKS Engine today. Um, because we were missing some features you have available in AKS, uh, one of them is to have, for example, different node pools. Um, so we needed different sized machines. For example, for running Neo4j optimally, we need machines with a huge amount of memory. And so we um, need different uh, a hybrid cluster of different machines. So we used AKS Engine, this feature was available, and this is now available, for example, in the product. So we triggered this into, into the product. And um, <clears throat> one important thing is, if you launch a new Kubernetes cluster, you draw images out of the in internet. It's, some are from Quay, some are from, from, from uh, GCR, from Google. And um, then you have some base images, and what we all introduced uh, is, is an image scanning, in, in image security. Um, so every image we are using, we copy them to a local Docker repository, and what we also do is uh, we introduce hashes for each image, so, so we can be ensure that even a tagged image um, might it might change the is recreated with the same tag. Uh, so this hash ensures that we never get a new version of any image without uh, without our control. So all our Docker images are in a local repository and they are scanned. We, we, we are also planning to introduce Aqua, for example, that prevents starting any Docker image that hasn't been scanned before. So this is uh, also features that Aqua developed in the last time that we are going to introduce to this solution. But currently, all our Docker images are scanned externally and are um, yeah come from our local repository, and we have full control which Docker images uh, are running. <clears throat> As you can see here, we have our microservices. Um, we are using Prometheus and Grafana for monitoring the whole application. We have Calico for uh, the implementation of our network policies. And uh, one detail about this, we are using multiple namespaces in our application. Um, if uh, there um, somebody there, sometimes there is a discussion. Um, if you have stages like development, QA, production, uh, this could be different namespaces. Um, we think this is not a good idea. For you will see later, Dev QA production, we use different um, uh, Kubernetes clusters because only then you have full control of uh, all the details. And we are using multiple namespaces for separating the services. And Kubernetes 1.11 introduced, for example, the possibility to combine namespace selectors with uh, pod selectors. So you can have, so we are running a default deny policy. No single application is allowed to talk to anywhere. Um, one attack vector we have to deal with is that there might be some faulty 
let's say, Docker image that has some fraudy co code which tries to steal data and send it to anywhere in the internet. And as I said, we are scanning the images, we are re reviewing what, we are, what code is running on the images, but uh, even if this image would run in our Kubernetes cluster, is, it would not be able to send any data out in the internet to, to an uncontrolled uh, IP address or domain name. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, the combination of uh, what I mentioned, uh, we, we are using multiple namespaces and RBAC allows us that operators can only ac access specific namespaces from where they can do specific deployments in other namespaces. So this is very strictly limited. Okay. Perfect. So to pick on the networking aspects um, in terms of that multi-layered security approach and a defense and depth mechanism, we um, basically decided that the cluster itself is not public facing at all. So the ingress controller parts are not exposing a public IP address on their own. But we use a platform as a service component in Azure called Azure Firewall that basically is a managed firewall piece that sits in front of the cluster. And it can be operated also um, not like your granddad's firewall with a ticketing system where you need to uh, send a ticket to, to an operations team and three days later you have the answer. It's also in our infrastructure as code deployment part of the actual deployment. So um, the DevOps team is in full control of, of that uh, firewall configuration and it's specifically tuned to that solution only. So it's not a shared firewall component, it's, a instan it's an instance that is specifically dedicated to protect that cluster. And basically all ingress and egress traffic that either leaves or hits the cluster needs to traverse through that firewall. And um, that firewall also comes with another interesting aspect. So it has machine learning capabilities built in and can flag incoming requests as dodgy. For example, um, it would throw an alert that um, you're being port scanned by a botnet. Because in the Microsoft security graph, we have basically the information um, collected from all the tenants that we, we serve and can use that information to overlay that with the actual networking aspects that we see on our platform. And combining those aspects, um, we basically make sure that if we have a configurational glitch, either in the firewall or on the cluster, on the ingress part, that um, the first line of security is still basically um, there, or another line of security is basically there from the networking perspective. And it also helps with um, the assumed breach um, um, idiom that we are following. So. Um, it also comes back to that red button later, but we, we always uh, think that we are under attack and that we cannot build a system that is 100% secure. At one point in time, there will be an intrusion. That's the kind of modus operandi that we use for the whole system. Let's um, continue a little bit on the networking aspect um, as it touches there. Um, in terms of integrating the Kubernetes cluster that runs in the end on top of virtual machines um, that are partially managed in that AKS engine um, setup. So AKS engine being the open source upstream component that we have for our managed Kubernetes service, AKS. Uh, Darko mentioned that we couldn't use it because we have missing features. Um, but the great thing was that we basically could contribute to the roadmap for the product group to uh, move that features over to the um, product itself. And one important aspect is that um, we can actually deploy the Kubernetes cluster within the virtual network. And there's a feature in Azure that allows you basically then to define that um, talking to platform as a service components with our multi-tenant by default can be locked in a way that, for example, that object storage account that you see there on the top can only be accessed from a networking perspective from that Kubernetes virtual network. Um, so no other kind of um, connections are allowed, being them external clusters um, or, or other um, third parties that try to, to hammer on that storage account. Um, we did that for other components as well. There are a few components on the Azure side that don't support that feature of that intimate inti 
integration between the virtual network and the platform service. For example, the Azure Container Registry, it's on the roadmap to do that. Then we kind of uh, move that over there as well. But ACR, um, the Container Registry, does not support that. But what do we do in order to make sure that the cluster can actually talk to that component and we lock it down? We then configure inside of the Azure Firewall via a whitelisting mechanism that traffic that originates from the cluster can actually hit that um, container registry. The same is for, for collection of logs. So we use something called log analytics where um, all the container logs um, that are generated in the cluster are basically exfilled and put into the um, log analytics component. But then, as we are processing very sensible information that actually, at one point in time, will leave the cluster, we are also challenged with the uh, question on how to make sure that documents that we generate as, as kind of reports from that research information can be protected when they leave the cluster. And this is um, yeah. so, where Darko kicks in so again. So people are finding documents, they're downloading the documents, so they're leaving our cluster, but we would still like to maintain security. What we do is, number one, we stamp the documents, so each copy of the documents has a visible stamp that this is a personal copy for a particular person. We have some invisible marks in the documents, so we can find on a technical way if even somebody removes the stamp. But what we do is we use Azure Information Protection and we encrypt the document. So what you download is technically something that is called .pdf or dot, 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 sorry, .docx, so it's a Word document or uh, a normal PDF document. But if you open this document in an Acrobat reader, you need to authenticate against the two-factor authentication of the Active Directory server. Um, and only you are permitted to open it. We have a time limitation, so the document is valid, for example, of 30 days. Every time you unlock the document, it's tracked on server side, so we can have limits how often this document can be encrypted because somebody might give away his uh, document to somebody else, including a password. You are prevented from doing screenshots and, uh, for example, for printing the document. So. Um, we integrated this Azure Information Protection. It's available as a service. We added a microservice in our landscape, which so we sent in, it's a REST service, we sent a P PDF document and we get a user-specific encrypted document that we can get give, uh, give out as a download to the end user. So this is a very nice feature and it fulfills, again, the two-factor authentication requirements. So this is very important. Now to the govern governance aspects. Yeah. So here you can see our environments. <clears throat> we have actually four different systems. Um, one is the so-called build system where we build everything. We have the dev, the QA, and production env environment. And as I say, um, the <clears throat> dev, QA, production environments are separate Kubernetes clusters. So this env environment that you have seen before is duplicated multiple times, except services like the Docker repository. This exists only once, for example. Um, and important, the build system, which is an Azure DevOps, is built uh, manually by the customer. So he created it, it's, he has the master keys, he is giving companies like Microsoft or Prodyna some limited access so we can create our Git repositories, we can have our uh, CI, CD pipelines, and um, we can work with it. And if he can reject everybody anytime, so this is fulfilled. He has full control of all people who are accessing the system. Additionally, as you can see, the build system contains our source code, and um, we create all other environments from source code. Uh, you can see uh, there was some infrastructure as code. We will go into details regarding this. We have identified that um, our dev QA and production are not handling real productive data um, because, for example, the dev environment has some custom login, some developers can access it who are not registered with the customers for easiness, for adding some people quickly. The QA environment, for example, is, um, is used by the customer for checking the new versions but still not uh, handling confidential data. Only the production environment is allowed to handle the full uh, secret data. Yeah, I'm through. Perfect. So kind of completing that picture again from the Azure side, what we did there to, to have that defense in depth, 
um, idiom followed again is um, the, the company or the enterprise uses like um, something called Azure policies that globally define certain rules. For example, a storage account can only accept HTTPS um, requests and HTTP requests are not allowed. And we also make sure that um, each environment is basically uh, being put into separate subscriptions where each subscription has specific role-based access controls depending on the actual audience that is allowed to, to work with that environment. And um, this governance at scale capabilities coming from Azure policies are currently also being extended to, to basically travel all the way down to the Kubernetes side with the um, open policy agent and the Kubernetes policies movement that's kicking in at the moment. And what it will give you in the end, for example, on, on our platform is that by management groups, um, this is like a grouping mechanism where you can use subscriptions, so the artifact where you deploy resources in Azure 2, and you can give it like a governance tree where you assign certain Kubernetes policies that you want to have followed up every time. Like, for example, using only specific um, container registries to pull from, or um, um, always requiring certain security policies on the Kubernetes cluster. And this trickles then all the way down in the tree, basically. So it gives you an external mechanism, but um, leaves you with the same kind of open source approach on the Kubernetes cluster side, but on a managed way on, on how you govern a large scale inter enterprise, it offers you that, that mechanics um, basically in Azure to, to interact with these two worlds. The next piece um, that we be touching now is the identity and access part. Um, we mentioned it a couple of times already. Two-factor was a must. Right, and it's important to know we have end users, about 10,000 end users accessing this application. All are authenticated against using two-factor authentication. And we have, let's say, a dozen of developers who are using kubectl to access the uh, resources in Azure and, and Kubernetes. And one detail we would like to show you is on a technical way is the challenge here is, again, um, you know, if you have kubectl, you have your config. Your config has keys, so you can access, um, you, you can access the, the, the Kubernetes cluster. And nobody can prevent me to give my keys, for example, to some other developers. But again, we would like to have full control who is, access, who is allowed to access the Kubernetes cluster. And there is a very nice mechanism built in Kubernetes by Microsoft. So we have a small video. So what we are doing here is um, we, are, um, we have a Kubernetes cluster. So we are using AZ and we are getting the credentials of this Kubernetes cluster down on our local kubectl uh, config. And then we would like to access it. So what I do is, uh, for example, a kubectl get nodes. And what happens now is, uh, as you can see here, kubectl get uh, it's a comment. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a comment. Yeah, you're, you're typing slow. So what you're doing is get notes. And there is a message saying, please go to Microsoft.com slash device login with this ID. So you go in the browser, you enter this ID, you authenticate, again, two-factor full-blown authentication. And behind the scenes, you get a, a certificate on your config, which is time limited. And this kubectl command now continues working. So it was interrupted. You authenticate, two-factor authentication, and you can continue working. This certificate has a certain validity. This is configurable, like a week or so. So you can work normally with kubectl, but I can restrict any user any time. And I have full control that only those people who I'm allowed to use um, to work in the project are allowed to actually access it. And this is very important. And only with this mechanism, we were able to fulfill this really important requirement. Because I don't know how you handle it, but I have seen really relaxed environments where people simply send around configs. And yeah, you have no control who is accessing your cluster. And this is a very nice mechanism. And important to mention, this feature is built in in kubectl. So Microsoft is a vendor who is participating open source. And one of the contributions for this tool is this feature. So it's built in. You, no special software install, installation required. And this is very, very, very powerful and was very nice in our project. Go yes. Um, the underlying piece is OpenID Connect. So it's no secret Microsoft source. What we did was um, basically making that 
really easy to, to integrate. Um, but you can do it also with other providers. Um, and I think it's a really important mechanism if you really want to step up on the security um, of your developers to protect the cluster um, yeah, for stuff like that. Unauthorized access. So just moving forward to um, the last piece of that puzzle. And this is the infrastructure as code part. So what we did was basically um, invested a hell of time in making sure that we can ramp up the whole thing that you can see on the right hand side completely via infrastructure as code. So our mantra was something that's not in Terraform is not reality um, and something that we cannot redeploy um, or something that we can only redeploy with manual interference might be acceptable for a limited amount of time to make progress but is technical debt that we need to clear up. And this was actually also a security requirement. So we worked together with an external auditor and um, for, for that auditor um, it was very refreshing actually that um, was actually some hands-on advices um, that we got and part of it was that the transparency that comes from configuration via code is actually a very important security mechanism because via this now we can review changes of the firewall rules for example of the white listings and we can create an Azure DevOps and approval cycle that basically signs off on changes that we either do on on um, cluster policies, um, RBAC setup, or something like that. All of that is deployed um, via, via Terraform. The moving pieces of the application are then deployed via specific pipelines into the cluster, but the fundamental or the foundation um, is being brought into play by this. One, one, one question to the audience. Who's using Terraform here? Uh, yeah, okay, this is a very popular tool. So, yeah, to summarize from my side, um, Terraform, um, it's a Git project, so we declare everything. It's, it's, it's declarative, it's not imperative. And um, we, we are working with pull requests, we are reviewing, we are doing uh, quality, and um, everything is run by DevOps. And as you have seen before, the um, environments are built automatically using infrastructure as code. It is a documentation, and we can we can demonstrate to the, to the auditor that the to be configuration is actually really implemented. And if you run multiple environments like FQA production, um, they, if you do this manually, they divergate over time. So you do some configuration here, forget it here. Um, this approach ensures that all environments are absolutely identical except the intended differences. And this really works. It's a lot of effort, to, to be honest, um, but it really works. Um, and back to the security uh, concern regarding um, the customer has created manually once the Azure DevOps environment. And everything from there is fully is created fully automated. So Azure DevOps is considered in our world as a high security environment, and our production environment is consi considered high security. And everywhere, in this constellation, the customer has again full control. He can kick out Microsoft, he can kick out Prodina if he wants, but um, because he has all the master keys of the, his own solutions, this is important. And actually that high sophistication that we put into the infrastructure as code um, and the configuration that we run via Terraform also enable us to fulfill one other request that the customer had the red button, the emergency pull. So think about what you are doing when you configure things like the firewalls via Terraform and, and configure also the uh, network security groups of the virtual network where Kubernetes resides in. You have all the information at your hand to create basically a lockdown script out of that. There's some thing called um, Azure Automation um, where you can basically create a workflow and then um, give certain users the right to execute that workflow. And what we do from the configuration, we basically generate like a shutdown script. And this script um, basically when it runs will do the following. It will drop all the network configuration um, so that we um, fall to a state of default deny for everything. So all the platform components are locked. Um, they accept no network traffic anymore. 
No network traffic is accepted anymore at the firewall. No network traffic is accepted anymore in that virtual network where the Kubernetes cluster resides in. So everything is basically locked down and um, ready for the um, for the team, for the threat response team of the uh, customer to investigate um, what was actually happening. So the forensics team can now come in and basically look at this thing that has not been deleted or something. It has just been locked down, so all doors are shut. shut. Um, back to the castle met metaphor, the drawbridge has been um, um, torn up and maybe the portcullis has been um, set down. So everything is um, at this state basically not receiving any network traffic anymore. And during the whole time we still collect logs. So all that flies back to um, a platform service that still collects the logs of the system. So we see what's, um, what's happening in the platform components. Logs from the Kubernetes cluster cannot egress anymore, as you see, because um, the firewall has been shut. So, um, but still we get the information from the platform components. And we will conclude basically um, with three key learnings. Why three? Because five are harder to remember and we thought three are good enough. Um, I would start with one and then Darko will pick it up. Uh, shifting left security. So that means security cannot be an afterthought, um, especially with enterprise customers being very, very, very concerned with their data in public cloud. So that was actually a very good kind of collaboration that we had there together as three. Um, so the customer, Prodyna and Microsoft, to work on that piece um, very early and to make sure that we have um, a lifecycle me mechanism combined with um, security. So there's a Microsoft, this um, secure development lifecycle. We actually didn't follow that because the customer has one um, that he already uses, but um, something like that actually helps to make sure that security is not an afterthought and you run out of time in the end and you go live with something where you didn't put in enough forward into security. You have a leech, all the trust that the customer is going down to zero and you can start all over. So not good for my business, <laughs> not good for Darko's, I guess. <laughs> yeah, second point, infrastructure as code. Um, as you can see, a large application is not only a Kubernetes cluster. It, we are using software as a service where it makes sense. We are using something like a Cosmos DB, for example. We are using storages. And this means we are not only in this, let's say, network policy, Calico, service mesh world. We have to consider every component that we are using. And so we need one tool that rules them all. So we're using Terraform, which offers different providers for Kubernetes, for Azure, for all of our components. And this is the only way, my personal opinion, I, I, I think you agree, how we can handle this challenging security stuff. It is a documentation, so we everything you do is fully documented. The external auditor can see in the code actually what was changed, when, why, by whom and um, we ensure that our to be state is really implemented. This is something that Terraform can tell us. It looks up and says, uh, this is what you want, this is what is current state. And um, yeah, it's a key technology for doing things like this. Um, manually clicking in the portal is nice for testing out features, but not for creating real world systems. Yeah, and finally, and I think that's a very important thing also, um, for my company, partnerships. So this all only works if we trust each other. The customer trusts Microsoft and trusts the partner and we trust each other um, to work on something that has not been done before at the customer. So first large cloud native system that we build at that customer and it required really um, stepping up in, in that partnership approach. So on the Microsoft side, we had some gaps in our products, but um, kind of being there, uh, very feedback interested um, to work on that was, was really important. And also, I think the collaboration that, that we established um, was also very fruitful because it, it just helps to talk and to listen and to make sure that the product team and Redmond also understands us. So 
Um, that's my my pick on that. Yeah, what, from my perspective, um, as a <clears throat> company creating the software, uh, we are no super experts in Azure. So um, we we asked Microsoft, Oliver, look, we have this challenge how to implement this using Azure. And he came up with, look, there's a nice product here, there's a nice feature here, and oops, there's a gap, but let's call some guys in Redmond, and they brought a new version, and suddenly we had a new feature that we could use. So this partnership was really important, and I think without uh, this constellation, we were not be able to, to implement this in, in, in this time, at least. Yeah? And this is really important. So, that's it. Um, we'll be staying here for questions, so just run into us if you have any. Or we can pass the mic. I'm open for anything. One left so. Perfect. I pass. I'll give you my mic and you can ask. Hi, so I have a question regarding the uh, infrastructure. Um, when you provision. So the initial, I, I repeat the question, I'm not sure if the mic picked it up correctly. So the question was on how to see the initial secrets that um, go into Key Vault. Tricky question, and that's actually um, always a pain. So you have that lockdown administrative station where you generate those, you put them in, you have then the policies on the Key Vault. Um, that allow read access um, during the Azure DevOps deployment cycle. But there is this moment where some administrator with larger privilege, privi you know what I mean, uh, <laughs> privileges, thank you, um, needs to do that, actually. You can generate them with Terraform, but that's not a good idea, as we all know, um, because they, they stay in the state, it's, it's not good. So um, stuff like that. There needs to be this provisioning cycle. Um, yes. So still, imp still important to, to to mention, if you're using Terraform and you're, for example, automatically creating some storage, you get the the keys for accessing it, and you store them in a secret in Kubernetes, and uh, this data is not seen by the administrator. So you simply execute the script. Technically, the keys were on the client, that's clear, but uh, they're not stored anywhere if you don't do stupid mistakes, uh, that, so they are in the in the state in the end. Uh, because to, um, in the future, if you need, uh, again, the keys for refreshing something, you will be looking them up. So the idea is um, the administrator is running a Terraform script, he is not seeing any keys, and he is. we are not storing the keys anywhere. So this is how we do it. Yeah. And then there's this detail, are we create, generating keys on Azure side, or are we bringing in our own Key. So this is variance how you could do. Um, yeah, things can get really quick, quickly, very complicated here. Yeah. Our friends from uh, friends from HashiCorp was um, the HashiCorp vault would also be a way to do that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Backup, disaster disaster. backup and disaster recovery scenarios. Um, Good one. Actually, in that specific project, um, we are not hit by SLA requirements so much. So we have actually the luxury of not um, running a 24 by 7 system. So everybody can live with a two hour outage in that scenario because the real value comes from that data mining that happens in the cluster. And so the pressure is a little bit off that. What we do is we back up that stuff um, outside, and um, the platform components have a backup strategy on their own. Um, for the Kubernetes part, we basically then recreate the cluster with Terraform if something happens bad and need to import the state. But we don't have the issue, <laughs> um, which would be a completely different thing if you are running a um, a shop front end or whatever, or a shop system, you cannot have downtime. So we can have downtime. Luxury. Yeah. Security was the highest concern of those kind of non-functional requirements. Availability lower, which helped us. And it was also very good to have that discussion very early on to understand what need, do we need to balance in what way. Yeah. 
Yes. Yes. Um, um, all environments live, run all the time. Uh, what we do is we reduce the clusters to a minimum so all services can run. We can scale down to zero sometimes. But uh, usually, uh, as I said, for production, we have 10 nodes full time running and we have up to 150 nodes running, for example, over, an EV, over a weekend where we uh, do everything. If we recreate a full cluster, so your question maybe is how long does Terraform need to create everything? Um, if you start with zero, so you, ha you have no prod environment and you start from scratch, uh, is about, I think, four hours. This is, I mean, Terraform, the script runs quickly, but um, this is all, you always have to synchronously wait. Uh, you apply for a storage. We have a lot of storages, um, so you have to apply, wait for the storage, get the keys, create some resource in Kubernetes, wait until everything is up and running. So four hours is um, the runtime for one environment. Yeah, question answered? Okay, next. <laughs> Let me answer that. <laughs> um, I think it's Azure Resource Manager templates, ARM templates are good if you are running a system that has not that level of diversity. Um, if your system is smaller and simpler and you have like five platform components, I think ARM templates are okay. If you have more challenging bits and pieces and also different systems that you need to talk to because Terraform also deploys like the RBAC rules um, during the initial deployment of the cluster and so forth. Um, so that's where things um, go lots of in favor for, for Terraform. What we did from the Microsoft side to um, support the Terraform provider. We have dedicated engineers now in that um, Terraform, on the Terraform provider project um, to, to make it more um, up to date in terms of our resources. Like if you would have asked me one and a half years ago, the, the state for Terraform was not that brilliant for us. Now it's, it's really good. You have always a little bit of a lag because the ARM templates are the native thing and they speak the native language and in Terraform you need to translate that. But um, I would always go for more complexity with Terraform. Yeah. We have to finish. Uh, I think the next talk will start soon. So um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, if you still have questions, we can. We have a booth here at, uh, pro, uh, at, um, at in, the, in the main. Um, uh, just uh, come to our booth. We can, we can continue talking if you want.